Hi, I'm Zivi Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Nancy Ju Yoon Kim is the author of What We Kept to Ourselves, a novel. Nancy is the New York Times bestselling author, also of The Last Story of Mina Lee, a Reese's Book Club pick. She was on this podcast to talk about that book as well. Born and raised in Los Angeles, she now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Now to discuss what we kept to ourselves, a novel. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Zibby. It's so great to be here again. And congratulations on Zibby Books and your bookstore. So thank exciting. You. Thank you. <laughs> I love this cover. Do you just have like bowls of little clementines around or tangerines? Those are persimmon. Oranges? Those are persimmon, which are, that's a Fuyu persimmon, which are actually in season right now. And so you can find them at your local grocer. <laughs> Maybe I'll bring your book into the grocery store. <laughs> if I do this, I will tag you. I'll try oh, and do it you. today. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Can you please tell listeners what your book is about? Yeah. What we kept to ourselves is about a Korean American family that lives in Los Angeles that is unraveling during, it actually begins in Y2K, sort of December, 1999. So it's unraveling for a lot of reasons, but primarily because of a missing mother who disappeared the past year, and then a dead stranger who appears in the backyard. And so it begins with a real <laughs> bang in a lot of ways. And it through this process of kind of coming to terms with what might have happened to her mother, who the, the, the mother who the stranger is in their backyard, the family begins to confront really what they know about their mother, what they know about themselves, and what they've been keeping from each other all along. So it's it's a family saga. It's got a little suspense, a little mystery, some thrills, uh, some tears, a little bit of laughter. It's it's quite a it's quite a book. It's quite big too. It's about four hundred <laughs> pages long. <laughs> it doesn't feel that it didn't feel, but it went so fast. Like it's fast reading. Like the way you write is oh, I mean, not fast you. in a bad way. I mean, it doesn't feel long and heavy and like difficult to get through. And it, it doesn't feel intimidating. That's the word. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a saga, and I hope an approachable saga because yes, these people are all very saga. real. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> these people are all very real. Like whether or not they remind us of what people in our families, we've encountered people like this. We know the dad who is, you know, holding on to his dilapidated car that means so much to him and probably shouldn't be driving as much as he does anymore. <laughs> we all get that. So <laughs> yes. you also have that, you know, universal regret when people we love are no longer with us in one way, shape, or form. And like what I wouldn't give to have another moment with ex with this yes. person or that person. And if only I had known this wouldn't have annoyed me or, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That is entirely universal. I think so much of our lives, you know, in, in many ways, this is very specifically an immigrant story, but it's universal in the sense that, you know, and within immigrant families, and this is something that I explore in my book, there's this sort of um, intergenerational conflict between language and not having the language mm -hmm. to tell each other different things. So we have Korean speaking parents, English speaking children. But I, I, I honestly think that that's kind of just like an intense representation of what we all go through universally. Mm -hmm. I think we all spend many hours in our day worrying about what to say to people, how to say it thinking about how someone said something to us or didn't say something to us. And so this struggle to communicate how we really feel and to be heard and seen by people we love is it belongs to everyone, right? I mean, it's our collective struggle, especially during the holiday season. I mean, <laughs> this yes. is when it all comes. This is like the boiling pot of <laughs> That's true. Yes, it can feel it can feel like you're not even speaking the same language. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <Yeah>. Between <laughs> generations with our kids, sometimes we literally aren't. And so uh, <laughs> And with our parents, sometimes we're literally not. I mean, it's 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 wild. Even if you all speak English, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the big gulfs. I like how also how you explore mother a mother disappearing, right? Because everyone wonders. There's a piece of ourselves that always disappears when we become a mother. Yes. There's another part that grows, right? And maybe takes right. the place of, but there is something that you lose. And Sunny was so young and so mm-hmm. clueless sort of getting into this whole relationship. I feel like she was almost duped a little bit, not duped, but you know, right. she was sold a bill of goods and then was like, oh, wait, you're not the stashing prince I thought you were. And here I am in America. <laughs> and you know, that's, you, you're working at a gas station. So anyway, but you know, you explore that. Like, what does that mean? Where, what would happen if we all got up and left to find ourselves. What would that do to the people who remain? It's so fascinating to me because I think that we, like, as you say, I think we do disappear in a lot of ways. Right. And so even though Sunny uh, physically disappears and, you know, I think that's a kind of metaphor for the way that we all disappear and the ways that we can kind of find ourselves also metaphorically without Mm -hmm. physically disappearing. So definitely this isn't a promotion. (laughs) disappear <laughs> literally but i think that there are ways that we can in in our daily lives make time for finding who we are i became a mother while i was writing the final version of this book you know Aww. so it, for me i mean imagine you know i was a pandemic you know i really hunkered down and wrote this book during 2020 to 2022 and that was like peak pandemic and i was also a new mother so in that process of course i knew firsthand what it was like i mean i disappeared from my friends mm-hmm. in a lot of ways because suddenly I was a mom and I didn't have any time for them. Yep. I disappeared as a daughter to my mother mm-hmm. because my mother started to sort of miss me because I wasn't around anymore, right? And I disappeared to myself in so many ways because I couldn't I couldn't spend time doing the things that I know myself were doing, you know, reading, writing, watching movies. Oh my gosh, I love movies, you know? <laughs> but the three hours is such a luxury. Two to three hours for a movie is, is huge, Right. And so, you know, I think this is in some ways an invitation to kind of reckon with the parts of ourselves that disappear and realize that there's still many manifestations and versions of our life that we can live. They're still out there. They're waiting for us. And it's just about timing and coincidence and when things just happen to work out as they do or don't for Sunny in this book. Yeah. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah. So for anybody who is struggling with motherhood. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I think you will relate uh, quite a bit to at least this desire to disappear. I I think of, you know, there's a good amount of fiction that, you know, I I think of Lisa Coe's The Leavers. There's, there's, there's a lot of books about mothers who who disappear and it's all about like, did something happen to her? Mm -hmm. Did she do this to herself? How Mm -hmm. could she possibly leave us? And so that's actually really a fascinating question because I think that in within society, it's almost considered unthinkable Mm -hmm. and unforgivable, right? I mean, it's kind of like a considered an unforgivable act. My, in my own family, my father actually left my family when I was six, he disappeared. Hmm. So, and he didn't pay child support. I grew up in a single parent, working class family. And we eventually, you know, he eventually came back and my parents were divorced and, you know, he was a Sunday father, but my father disappeared. But I, I think we see that a lot more, that that's a more familiar narrative. And that's actually in some ways a more acceptable narrative, the father that leaves, because, you know, men have complicated lives and they've got to go take care of themselves. But what about women? You know? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. Isn't that like in Celeste Angs, I know this much is true. Isn't remember the mom like goes away for a while? Doesn't she? Am I like, maybe I'm mixing everything up the- I never told everything I never told you? Yeah. So what did I say? I, I, I want to say that yes, you're right. Yeah, I know this much is true. <laughs> oh God, no, that's Wally Lamb. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. All these titles are very, very similar. <laughs> All these multi multi word titles, that, yeah, and I think that they all have a similar cadence to them. You know, like yeah, they have the same yeah. rhythm. Too. Okay, so we won't but tell I think anyone. She does disappear for a little bit, doesn't she? And then she comes back or something. But yes, I see yes. what you're saying. I mean, in truth, any parent disappearing, it's not a good thing. You know, right, right. Of course, is like you know, <laughs> I, that is the most destabilizing thing was when you don't yes. have answers too. I mean, it's one right. thing when you not to say it's uh, anything is better or worse, but at least when. Like when you lose someone, you can start the grieving process and you exactly. you, you know how to go through that. Other people have gone through that. But when there's so much uncertainty, then what? Yeah. And so John, six months after his wife disappears, and this is in the beginning of the book, he tells his kids that he, yeah, that she's she dead. Yeah. Because he thinks that's easier. And that, that is easier in some weird way, right? Because then they can begin to move on. But the kids don't believe him, of course. Yeah. <laughs> or one of them doesn't, one of them doesn't. So, and you know, and that's also very complicated between siblings. I mean, that makes total sense to me. Yep. You have a sibling? I do. I have a sister. Yeah. 
Not close necessarily. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you almost didn't even need to say that. <laughs> There's a lot of love though. There's a lot of love, but That's you know, good. we all have such different experiences of the things that we go through as children mm-hmm. and you know, um, we all grow differently too. Yeah. It's fascinating. Just siblings are fascinating, very complicated, you know, relationships. Yes. Yeah. But also now is just one of the seasons of your relationship with her. You know what I mean? Like you don't even know in 10 years. Right. You don't even know because I had never anticipated any of this either, you know? Right. And I think that's what makes life so interesting to a certain mm-hmm. extent, you know? Like you just never know how things can come together and how they don't. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of people, they read my my books and both of my books deal with the loss or the disappearance of a mother or mother figures, mother characters. A lot of people you know, will ask me about, you know, will tell tell me about how this book reminded them about how they had wished they had asked or spent more time with certain family members, or mm-hmm. they wish their parents had talked more about this or that. And I, I completely identify with that feeling. I mean, I think that's why I write the books I wrote, I write, but I also, I, I also hope this is an invitation for people to think about the stories that they tell, not necessarily mm-hmm. just their children, but the world about yeah. who they are. And to not assume that people aren't interested. I mean, I think that's what we do, right? Like mm-hmm. I was at a party this weekend and somebody was like, nobody's ever going to want to hear my story. Nobody's ever. But like, that's kind of just an assumption because it's really all about how you frame the story yes. that really draws people in. Because any life can be made extraordinary by the way it's told, you exactly. know? And so the ticket is really thinking like, how are you going to pull people in mm-hmm. with a story that might seem very ordinary on the outside? Because to us, our own lives are always ordinary. Right. But then like, look at, (laughs) look at Seinfeld, right? I mean, that was just making the everyday into something that makes us all laugh and relate to like, everyday you know? Right. And so I hope this book is also an invitation to share as much about ourselves with people that we love as possible. That's safe for you. And in a way that feels authentic to you, that could be in a form of, you know, telling a real story. It could be in the form of the way you dress in the meals that you cook. There's so many ways to tell stories that matter and that last. And that um, really down the line, I think, I mean, that's what people remember about us and what people hold on to the closest when they need us and we're not able to be there, you know? How did, how did you learn how to tell stories? Oh, that's such a great question. It must be through because I grew up just like in the characters in my novel. I grew up in families where there were Korean speakers and English speakers, and I'm not fluent in Korean. So I couldn't access a lot of information. And I think for that reason, I became a storyteller because I had to kind of imagine, I had to kind of fill in a lot of gaps within my family's lives. And so it was very imaginative. I had a lot of free time and free play, if that makes sense, Mm -hmm. to sort of, I was a very big Mm make-believer, you know? I love make-believe. I always caught dreaming. And so somewhere in that space, I kind of feel like I was so freely given an opportunity to imagine and play and make believe that I learned to somehow organize that information through writing. I think it's Mm -hmm. just like a form of organization in some weird way. You know, because it's kind of a dream space that you're in that you're trying to communicate to others, but you can't exactly translate what's in your head to people without writing it down Mm -hmm. and then going through the process of revising and revising. So for me, it was in that sense. And I also have storytellers in my family in the sense that my mother is an extraordinary cook. And I think that she that's her form of storytelling. And she got that from my grandmother. And that was a very traditional kind of woman's role, right? Which is to pass down traditions and meaning through food and gathering. And, you know, my my grandfather was an artist and that plays into the novel because I have a lot of painters and artists in my novel. And that was his form of storytelling. He was a silent man. He was so quiet. But when I look deeply at his at his paintings, I realized what he was trying to tell me through them. And so I think that that's really, really wonderful, regardless of what he knew about the effect of his paintings as he was creating them, that he gives those, to, that he has left me paintings. And it's a kind of artifact of where I come from without him having even known that he was doing this for me personally, right? Interesting. My grandmother so, did the same thing. She oh, wow. uh, later in life she took up painting and oh my goodness had like you know the paint tubes everywhere and would like give me oh things and, I know and I have like all her paintings oh and my I was goodness like, of course I want them you know they and they meant so much to her. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. And it's like when people you look at it on the wall and it's a reminder of. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just a, such a powerful form of storytelling for people who either personally couldn't express themselves or for whatever reason, the social circumstances didn't allow them to. Mm-hmm. And um, my paintings are so meaningful. And hopefully, you know, my daughter cares about them at one point in her life. And just knowing that we can 
we have this sort of focal point to be able to discuss our families in a way that isn't overwhelming, you mm-hmm. know? It's an introduction to start a conversation. I mean, that's great <laughs> art, great design, you know? Yep. Well, in your family, I know your title is What We Kept to Ourselves. What What do you keep to yourselves? Ooh, that's a great question. I think for many years, I... I had never heard my mother express how much she loved me, how much she cared for me. You know, she worked so hard. I I don't, I think that it was so, her emotionals, her emotions were so overwhelming. I think that she just didn't know how to express that in words, you know? And so she did it by putting her head down and she was a single mom, working class, non-English speaking, Koreatown, Los Angeles. She worked so many jobs. And I think that she could not find the time to put the words together. For whatever reason, you know, either it was too painful, it was too overwhelming. She just couldn't process her emotions in that way because she was so busy. But I remember very explicitly, and this is, this is, and I carry this for the rest of my life. My mother, when I was in my, my teenage years, I was very worried about applying to colleges, you know, college applications. Everyone else seemed to be, have so many more advantages than me. I was struggling so much in, in so many ways in my life, not necessarily academically, but with, the dynamics of my family. And I remember my mother one time telling me over the phone very slowly, and she doesn't speak English. She said very carefully, like she looked up every single word in the Korean to English dictionary, because this was like before the regular internet where we had it everywhere. (laughs) She said the words, I believe in you. And she said it in this very soft, robotic, (laughs) like she had strung together this sentence with all of her might. And I I broke down because I realized that she has always believed in me. You know, she's always loved me, but she never had found that it took her such an extraordinary, a Herculean amount of energy to express this to me. And I realized that, you know, a lot of people go through life this way. I think as writers and as readers, we're very, very lucky. Like it's easier for us to express ourselves, but so many people go through life without the language, regardless of what language it is, but without the language to really be, to feel like their voice matters, to feel like they should be heard, that it matters to say that to someone. So many people feel that way. And I really that those four words, which was her own little form of like telling me how much she believed in me, was her way of kind of affirming that, you know, uh, not only her emotional life, you know, and the things that she feels and what she's kept to herself, but that I had inherited so many of the qualities that had created her ability to do that. You know, so it was so affirming on such a multiple, on so many multiple layers. So that is what my family kept to itself. (laughs) Unfortunately, it withheld love when I needed it when I was younger, because I think my mother, you know, just worked too hard. And I think that for her, you know, uh, for a lot of families, it's an expression of, of vulnerability, of intimacy. And it's a, it's a very difficult thing to manage when the world requires you to be so tough in so many ways, right? I mean, especially for, you know, working parents who are spending so much of their lives, like, you know, putting on a face to show up at work, you know, we all relate to this. And then suddenly we are encountered with these creatures. Children are so lovely because they're so vulnerable and they're so real, right? (laughs) And to kind of be able to switch and like that quickly on a dime Mm -hmm. when the world wants us to be so hard is very, very difficult. And so that's, yeah, that's definitely something my my family comes with. So hopefully I'm, I'm the opposite with my daughter. I'm almost like annoyingly loving, which is probably, <laughs> she's only three and I'm already like all the time, like, I love you. You're amazing. Like, you know, I'm so proud of you. You know, she's just like rolling her eyes at me already. But <laughs> So it's almost no surprise that you write books searching for your, searching for moms who can bring their love back, right? Ah, uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have such a special bond with my mother. I mean, I I think we all have special bonds with our parents in various ways. But for us, because I think we were a very small family, Mm -hmm. most of my family is in Korea or in Canada. We really had to be everything for each other, you know, in a way that was kind of dysfunctional, you Mm. you know, like I was like, you know, we were every like there were times when I was her mother and she was my Mm. daughter. You know, and I had to take her to the DMV and take care of her. And that reversal of roles that you, that sort of happens with elderly parents, you know, that we experience, I actually happened when I was very young because my mother couldn't navigate a lot of the systems that she was in in America as a Korean speaking, you know, 
single mother. I mean, she was on her own. And, you know, so she had her little daughter taking her to the DMV and filling out forms for her, (laughs) (laughs) which I am planning on doing now, actually, for her simply because of age. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, isn't it crazy how our brains just use all this information and then turn it into a story that's like immersive and wonderful for other people to read and yet has all these little bits and pieces of our own lives and feelings. And yet there it is. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. And that's what makes it so magical. I mean, I think this is why there's no way, you know, I mean, I know there's always this, you know, I know, I know, I know there are people who would like to replace us, but (laughs) 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 there are people who like to replace us. But the whole point of reading books is really a connection with another human being. You know, it's like the fact that it connects me and you together. We're from two very, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what time zone in you're in right now. I'm on the West coast, but we're from very two different lives. And yet we sat together at some point in time, maybe not at the exact same moments, but we sat together with a world within a space and we both found some kind of meeting within it. Right. Like it made sense to us in a way that is like conversational and beautiful without even us actually meeting each other. And I think that that is really the point of reading in books. And so ultimately, if books aren't really written by people, I think that if there's no purpose, why wouldn't I, I feel like there's so many other things we could be doing? Yeah. I mean, I could be, you know, gardening. Yeah. I could be. <laughs> you could be at the DMV. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I could be at the DMV. But I mean, I make the time to make connections with books because I connect with people through them. You know, I find the best people like you, Zippy, through oh, books. I mean, really, I've, don't we meet such cool people? We such the cool people. people. The coolest yeah. people. So, you know, because you you have to look at the world in a certain way. Yeah. I totally it's just agree. so fascinating. Yeah. I, I think I've made some of the uh, people that I would have never met mm-hmm. without books. I mean, I mean it, it's, in tr- it's what it really is. Like, I like to say that no two people who have read the same book are really strangers because we all have mutual friends. It's like, oh, you know, that girl from college, blah, blah, blah. It's like a shorthand right now. We all have every book we read. It's a shorthand with other yeah. people. It's a kind of community, which is really fascinating. And it's almost like, um, I kind of think of books as like instruments and everybody picks it up and plays it a little differently. Ooh, I like that. You know, but we've all held the same instrument. So we all mm. kind of, and we all understand its nuances to a certain extent. <laughs> and it could create really beautiful conversation or music when it's played together in a really interesting way. And so, yeah, I love the idea of the book as this kind of, as this kind of object that people can kind of channel themselves through and everyone will have a different way of playing the book. I mean, that's why we have books and some people hate them and some people love them. But at the same, at at the end of the day, that book kind of passed through a a person passed through that book Mm -hmm. in a really fascinating way. Mm -hmm. And like nothing really, nothing really replaces. I mean, you know, that's like, that's almost like the point of life. Nancy, I think I think they should like take us on the road here and just talk about reading, right? Look at us. What we're just like say? a big advertisement for the power of reading. I mean, I look at so. Oh, we're great. <laughs> I mean, who who's out there? Who's listening? <laughs> <laughs> we're available kind of. <laughs> well, I I mean, I I I think a lot of people will hear this and they I think they it'll click. Like I think they totally know what we're, we have we know our people are out there. Yes. <laughs> and hopefully they're listening. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, quick question. What are you working on now? Do you have another book? Are you, what are you up to? Yes. So my brain is like half in one book, this book, and then half in another book. I'm working on a third book, which would be considered the third book in a kind of trilogy. So this is, you know, and they're not sequels in the sense that you don't have to read one to understand the other, but they're kind of reflections on family and the all in vive crime and punishment, secrets, shame, mm-hmm. you know? And so my third book will be literary also, but it'll kind of play on elements of thriller, which mm-hmm. to me is new because I, I do, I use mystery and I use suspense in my first two books, but I'm kind of more, I'm kind of interested in a different kind of pace for my mm-hmm. next book. So that'll be an adventure, but it'll also be a Korean American family in Los Angeles. Amazing. So it it should be fun. I mean, I, I'm trying to just keep it fun, to be honest. Not fun. Like, I mean, I know the content of my stories, you know, it's very emotional. It can be heavy at times, but I'm trying to keep the actual genre and the, the I try to keep the playfulness alive because I think that's just going to be, everyone's motivated by different things. And mm-hmm. what motivates me is I need to constantly be challenged. So this is like my next challenge. I love it. If it's, Aww, not, thank if you. it's not fun for you, 
you know, it's not going to be fun for us to read. So you might as well enjoy it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Well, congratulations. What we kept to ourselves. Thank you so much for having me. I'm off to the grocery store now so I can take a cool picture. (laughs) Brought to you by Persimmons. (laughs) This was made for by Persimmons. No. Made for by Persimmons and the American Reading Association. (laughs) I know. Well, we love them. Well, I love them both. So, you know. There we go. We'll see. Maybe we'll, I mean, we can all use a little bit more uh, fruit and vegetables in our lives. So that's true. Who knew I would get mine on a book cover? Yeah. That, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for catching up with me. That was so you fun. Zibby. That was so Happy fun. Happy holidays. Okay, yeah, you take too. care. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 